Good afternoon. I'm Gerald West, Vice President of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, and I would like to welcome you to our discussion of America's political dynasties. And in particular, we are here to celebrate the new book by uh, Stephen Hess uh, on uh, this uh, topic. And this is the inaugural event of the Brookings Book Club. Uh, this is going to be a series of discussions of the latest books being published by uh, Brookings Institution uh, Press, and we do appreciate the financial support that the press has provided for uh, this uh, particular event. The topic of dynasties is as American as apple pie. As Steve has demonstrated very convincingly in his book, the United States has seen dynasties from the Adams to the current period of the Clintons and the Bushes. Uh, his book is a fascinating account of this phenomena. Uh, Tom Brokaw says his book is, quote, a great gift to students of American history. Chris Matthews, uh, meanwhile, notes the threat represented by dynasties. Uh, he says Steve's book is a fascinating study of the dangers of selecting a country's leaders uh, based on their bloodlines. So tonight, we uh, are going to hear a terrific discussion of the history and contemporary relevance of political dynasties. Uh, we have two fabulous speakers who will be presenting uh, their points of view on this uh, subject. And after we uh, hear from them and uh, take questions from the audience, uh, we invite you to join us after the event for a reception. And for those of you who didn't pre-order uh, the book, uh, Steve will be uh, right outside the auditorium uh, signing books after the event. So to help us understand this subject, I'm pleased to introduce our experts uh, for tonight. Uh, Steve Hess is a Senior Fellow Emeritus in the Governance Studies Program here at Brookings, and he is one of our nation's foremost authorities on American politics. He joined Brookings in 1972 and is the author of numerous books. I won't go through all of them, uh, but his uh, books include News and Newsmaking, The Presidential Campaign, The Ultimate Insiders, the Washington Reporters, American Political Cartoons, and most recently, The Professor and the President, which is a terrific uh, book that Brookings Institution Press uh, just published last year on the fascinating relationship between Richard Nixon and Daniel Patrick uh, Moynihan. Uh, Steve uh, served uh, on the White House staff during the Nixon presidency, so had a front row seat for that particular relationship. And it is a great read, so I highly recommend uh, that book along with his uh, new book. Joining him is Cokie Roberts, an award-winning uh, journalist. Uh, Cokie served for many years as the congressional correspondent, a senior a news analyst, uh, and a political commentator for National Public Radio. Uh, she still is there as a contributing <laughs> senior news analyst. You often see her on the roundtable for This Week with George Stephanopoulos, and she also serves as a commentator for ABC News. She is the recipient of many distinguished awards, including the Edward uh, Murrow Award, the Everett McKinsley Dirksen Award, and an Emmy Award for her uh, news reporting. She also is the author of uh, several books, including Capital Dames, Founding Mothers, Ladies of Liberty, and with her husband, uh, Stephen Roberts, uh, this, uh, from this day uh, forward. So please join me in welcoming Steve and Koki to Brooklyn. I should make one correction. Not only will my book be out there for me to autograph, <laughs> but there will be one of Koki's books, the one I picked for this, which is Ladies of Liberty, which I love, and not only she, I, I hope, will sign that for those uh, who are interested. I want to start with a, with a Koki story. <clears throat> this, this starts in um, uh, late. Uh, late uh, July, and it was my idea that with the publication of America's Political Dynasties, I would put together a little game called Which is the Greatest Dynasty? Uh, and eventually, in a couple weeks, I think it's going to go on the Brookings website. Uh, but with uh, my wonderful interns, uh, using the biographical directory of the American Congress, we put together uh, a system that was really three parts. It included generations, how many generations of the family in politics, uh, members, not how many were in politics, and then finally some scale based on the jobs they held. Ten points for president, two points uh, for, uh, for members of the House of Representatives. So in late April, I called Koki, 
And I said, I have great news. <laughs> Your family, the Claibons, are the third greatest American political dynasty. dynasty. She thought that was nice. <laughs> she asked for the data. <laughs> she went over the data. And she noted that we had left out, because it wasn't in the biographical directory of the American presidency, but she could prove it. Uh, we had left out a senator from Alabama who served two terms. I should say, in the order of importance, number one was the Roosevelt's, number two were the Kennedy's, the Claibons were number three. The point score was listed. Uh, so she uh, informed us that there was a two-term senator from Alabama who, who uh, resigned uh, to enter the Confederacy, and this, therefore, was worth uh, three points a term, or six points plus two bonus points, or eight points, which happened to put her ahead of the Kennedys. Now I was worried that she might be going after the the I the was, Rose I was about it. <laughs> and I found three more today. Well, we'll, we'll get to it. Yeah, that's right. At that point, I said, uh, sent her note. I said, well, genealogists uh, have shown that uh, Teddy Roosevelt and and Franklin Roosevelt are blood relations to eight presidents. Yes. Yeah, but at any rate, we shall we shall see uh, Koki's latest uh, latest uh, speech. The, 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 coming back a little farther, about uh, 1970, uh, a relative of yours, uh, Claiborne Pell, said more in sorrow, anger not. Uh, why didn't I include the the Claiborne's in this book, which originally came out in 1966? Truth of the matter is, I didn't know. Uh, there are 44 families. In American history, that could have qualified for this book. Uh, we we think of this as a as an event dynasties that are all around us, uh, but in fact, uh, of the 44 that had uh, more than three uh, generations in Congress, this really only amounted to six percent uh, of the 11,000 men and women who have served in, in Congress. So we're talking about a very special bunch of people. Uh, and why I did pick this family, uh, had, had I had foresight, I would have said to the senator, well, if you'll wait a couple years, we will have Lindy Boggs, and she was elected nine times, so that's 18 points, that's she right. gets another two bonus <laughs> points, that's 20 points, so I could have seen that, but unfortunately, I, I didn't I didn't have that. How I picked them, them I, don't, I don't know, obviously, the, there were the presidents, uh, they had to go in. There were some families uh, that you, so interesting, you had to put in. The Washburn family of Maine had four brothers who were in the United States House of Representatives from four different states, Maine, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, and uh, Minnesota, three at the same time. You had to put them in. I had to see how you could avoid uh, the uh, the longs. They, they, they were, I could. You could. <laughs> <laughs> from Louisiana, what could I do? <laughs> <laughs> the Longs. Uh, there was a there was a family, very important family from Massachusetts, called who was spelled H O A R. And I would love to have put in the whores of Massachusetts, but I already, but I already had three Massachusetts families: the Adamses, the Kennedys, uh, uh, the, uh, and uh, the Adamses, the Kennedys, the Longs. Oh, the Lodges, the Lodges. So, at any rate, all, all I can promise with my mea culpa <laughs> to you is. 50 years hence, when I do the third edition, I absolutely promise that I will include the Claiborne's. And so, my first question to you, I hope, is um, what should my lead be? About the Claiborne's? Absolutely. When I write about the Claiborne's, uh, how should I start? Oh, I think that your lead should be that they uh, have been a family dedicated to public service, but also very much wanting to get elected. Um, uh, for for generations, and I should say, by the way, um, Barbara Mannard, Courtney Payne, granddaughters of Ethel Claiborne Dameron are here, and Nina Boggs, wife of Douglas Claiborne Boggs and mother of William Claiborne Boggs, is here. Uh, and is Claiborne Pell here? He's there. He is. Stand up, Clay. 
This is our cousin Claiborne Pell. <laughs> he is the grandson of the Claiborne Pell that, um, that Steve just referenced. And, um, and Clay ran for governor of Rhode Island, and, uh, and he will win next time. And uh, so it is carrying on onto the next generation, which is wonderful because it really is a, a dedication to public service. And, um, you know, when I was going back, some, some dedicated descendant of the first William Claiborne who came in, in 1621 uh, wrote uh, the Claiborne's of Virginia, and he did it down to the seventh generation, uh, at least in some cases. And it's unbelievably footnoted and all of that. So I went dashing through it, found three more in Congress. But, um, but what was so remarkable was even if they weren't in Congress, they were in some public office in every generation. So that by the, um, and he, the, the one who came, was the council and secretary of the colony of Jamestown. But then, um, you know, by the time you're down to the fifth generation, there are 14 members of them in the House of Burgesses or in the sheriffs or dele- in the House of Delegates, depending on the state. And by the sixth, the United States was a country. And, um, and so uh, seven went to Congress. Um, and I mean, excuse me, two went to Congress, but 18 of their cousins were in the state legislatures. One was the mayor of Richmond. Um, um, there were sheriffs, justices of the peace. I mean, they were all over the place. And then by the seventh generation, they were populating the United States Congress. Uh, and, um, and so they were, you know, two of, two of the sons of the first congressman, Thomas, um, who one took his Virginia seat, the other was from Tennessee. Uh, also from that generation, James Robert Clayton of Missouri in Congress. Another one I just learned about today, William Osborne Good of Virginia, son of Lucy Claiborne, uh, Nathaniel Herbert of Virginia, brother of the most famous Claiborne of the 19th century, William Charles Cole Claiborne, whose story alone, Steve, would be a lead. Uh, you know, he yeah. came to Congress before he was 25 years old. Uh, he had to be seated in contravention of the Constitution because he was the only person from Tennessee to take the seat. And, um, and then when Jefferson, when the Burr Jefferson tie comes, he's the only member from Tennessee. So his vote counts as much as all of Virginia, all of Massachusetts. And, um, and everybody thought he could be turned because he was so young and so vain. And, um, and then he stuck with Jefferson and a month later became governor of the Mississippi ter- Territory. And uh, then when Jefferson fought Louisiana, became uh, governor of the, Missis- of the Louisiana Territory. And then was elected to the Senate. Well, you, you, yeah, partly, the goes on, you, 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 you partly lead to my next question, though, because if you look at many of the dynasties throughout the United States, they are really rooted in one state. The Tafts of Ohio, the Byers of Delaware, the Muhlenbergs of Pennsylvania, the Freelinghouse of New Jersey. Your family just keeps wandering. They keep going. And, well, I counted, what, nine states? Nine states. Nine, nine states. That we know of so that far. We know of. keep finding them. Yeah. But, um, and, and, and the reason? And the, Well, part of it was that they needed to make a living, but part of it was they would have to run against a brother or a cousin. Uh, to be where they were, so, you know, to move on to another state so they could have a free slate uh, was a, a useful thing for them to do. Yeah, that, 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 of course, is another thing. Some states just run out of jobs for the ambitions of the people. Right. Obviously, no. the Kennedys are of Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, right. and, uh, and, and Maryland as well. But and the reason unusual. William Charles Cole was, ran from Tennessee, actually, is because... Um, he was a young, uh, very young teenager working uh, for the uh, House of Representatives. And the enrolling clerk was the brother-in-law of his uncle. And, um, and the enrolling clerk said to him, look, I know you want to be in Congress, but you're from Virginia. Forget it. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, those seats are taken, including by several members of his family. So he said, go to Tennessee. There's nobody there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it became a state very quickly, as you remember. Mm-hmm. And so when uh, Andrew Jackson was in the Congress, he quit to become a senator, and it left the seat open. Well, you know, of course, again, 
Many uh, of these families had a real founding father. Joseph Kennedy Sr. knew very well that he wanted his son to be president. His son died. The next son would become president. I think Alfonso Taft had the same feeling. They're not really a founding father, or is there? No, but it is true that, as I was saying, it was just in the blood. I mean, this first guy who came in 1621, his father and grandfather before him in England had been aldermen and mayor uh, in the 16th century. So, um, you know, and I don't know how far back that goes. They weren't electing a lot of people in England at that point. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but it, it, you, you <laughs> haven't said yet about the thing that is so important in your books and is so hard to construct in a book called America's Political Dynasties, which, after all, well into the 20th century, is all about men, uh, is the amazing role that, that women did. Uh, and I, I, We both love the Adamses in different ways greatly. <laughs> and I, I, I said to Koki, and she could quite agree with me, that if women had had the right to vote in the Constitution, that Abigail Adams would have been a lot better politician and probably wouldn't have been defeated, had much greater social skills, uh, actually writing skills as well for, for that matter. She had wonderful writing skills and she was, uh, she was very savvy politically. Um, and John counted on her political advice uh, all the time. Uh, he, was, he was really a total clunker when it came to political sensitivity. And, um, and she wrote him very uh, telling letters all the time that he was abroad and all of that. And, and then when he was elected president and she was trying to get things in order at home, he wrote her one letter after another. You've got to come. I can't do this without you. Get here. You know, and his mother is dying and she says, I really have to take care of your mother. He says, the mother? What about me? <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the truth is, you know, something funny happened to Abigail Adams, and it happens, I think, in every administration. You've seen this from inside the White House, Steve. The, they develop such a bunker mentality yeah. that they think that everybody outside is out to get them, and she definitely developed That's that right. and became such a, yeah. such a devotee of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Yeah. Then that went a long way to defeating them. Yeah. I, I, I added a story about her. This edition, as is, is, is I hinted at, was first written 50 years ago, published 50 years ago. And I thought, uh, when Brookings asked me to bring it out, 2016, it seems to be a good year for dynasty books, <laughs> uh, that all I would have to do would be add uh, a uh, extended uh, italicized size to each to each chapter, uh, other than write about the Bushes, the Clintons, and an introduction. This um, this turned out not to be possible. Uh, it, it, it simply, too much had happened on, on too many levels. At one level, of course, as historians don't stop writing. And this is the case with the Adamses. Of course, the Adamses saved every piece of paper that ever came by, and it, people have been writing about the Adamses since. And I simply had to add this story to the Adams chapter. You would think, what can you add? They haven't been in politics for 150 years. <laughs> uh, and the story was very simple. Uh, when he was off in France, and for a very long time, uh, she had to run the farm initially. This was not easy because uh, there weren't any farm laborers. They were all in the army. Yeah, and the uh, bridges tax, were coming. Uh, taxes <laughs> were very high. The bridges were coming and so forth. And so she figured out a very clever way to, to do tenant farming and did that. But she did something else. She went into trade. Mm -hmm. And what happened was John was sending her little things from France, a handkerchief, a silk scarf, and she would sell it. And uh, she wanted, she said, John, um, this is retail. We should be in wholesale. And he said, but, but you know, all those ships that are into stuff, we would, and, and she said, John, and this is a letter of her, if we lose two out of three ships, we will still make a profit. Well, and he said, wow, you seem to know your business. And so he said, he was happy to turn it over to her. And now, of course, she could adjust the market, 
well, we have too many scars this, this month. Maybe we should have handkerchiefs and so forth. And it was real because he never worked other than for the federal Come government on, in his life. She turned the family uh, solvency for the family. I think it's a marvelous Well, she, she did a lot of things like that. And, of course, you know, women, married women were not allowed to own property. They were the property of their husbands. Um, uh, but she was buying and selling property, and everybody knew he wasn't there. He was in Paris, um, but um, and uh, but they uh, basically just did business with her uh, because she was she was a very astute businesswoman. Yeah. He he would write her the most ridiculous letters though from France. I mean, you know, he wrote her one letter saying you know, how beautiful and gifted all the French women were. Oh wow! Right. <laughs> right. Right. Great, good, good work, John. Good work, yeah. John. Right. <laughs> you know, there's something else about that. That family, which I think is interesting because unfortunately it comes over in dynasties after dynasties. John and Abigail had one son who was president of the United States and two sons who became alcoholics. And the whole, it's a sad history you see throughout these families. It's hard to be an Adams. John Adams had one son who was a great diplomat, another son was a suicide. And so the stories of these uh, dynasties, which you think are going to be glorious, are often very, very sad. Yes. Drug addiction, uh, alcoholism, sex scandals, business scandals, uh, and so forth. It's just Well, really, out of the four children of John and Abigail Adams, the four that survived, uh, you know, the two of the boys were total wastrels, and, and uh, their daughter married a jerk. Oh, and um, he was in Congress, though. But, um, and... Um, uh, and uh, so it was really only John Quincy, and you can make the case, I hate to do it, but John Quincy wasn't raised by his mother. The others were, but he went off to, to Europe with his father when he was 10 years yeah, old. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it, it, it's not only, of course, their children, but the stories of the in-laws. Well, you know, families are fascinating. Everybody knows <laughs> that. Every family is fascinating, but the stories there, it's not just your children, it's your in-laws. And wow, you look at some of these in-laws. One was, one was accused of being a witch. This goes far back. Uh, and she was having fits, and, and this was in, in the Bayard by family. Fortunately, uh, her husband's uh, uncle was Peter Stuyvesant, who happened to be the head of New York City. And he just got in touch with the, the governor of, of Massachusetts, and they straightened that off uh, fairly <laughs> quickly. Uh, but uh, not every family had a witch in it. Some had spies. George, Wa some of George Washington's spies uh, were in the in the what? The Stockton or Livingston family. Stockton. Yeah, Stockton. right. That's uh, one. One married a person who claimed uh, they claimed he was uh, dead for four years, four <laughs> sorry, four four, uh, four days, and, and returned to Earth and told about about heaven. So there are wonderful, <laughs> wonderful stories throughout. The, the the nice part about your books, my books. They're, so, they're perfect for storytelling. The well, first, I argue that all of history should be storytelling. Yeah, yeah. That is what the word means. Uh, but um, but people have managed to squeeze all the juice out of it and make it boring, as opposed to telling the wonderful yeah. stories. But something that happened, in a sense, uh, in Dynasty, when I first wrote the book, your own experiences with your mother and father, I think dynasties were 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 quite honored. Uh, we've reached a moment where uh, there, there's great skepticism about them and great uh, dissatisfaction and so forth. What, 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 what do you think turned that suddenly? Oh, I think some of it is that everybody's dissatisfied with politicians, period. Uh -huh. and, um, and anybody who's an insider, particularly, and so who is more inside than somebody whose family has been around forever? Yeah, well, and so I think that's a very strong view. Well, when you have a Bush, when the two dynasties people seem to be upset about are the Bushes and the Clintons, uh, everybody is upset with at least one of them. That's right. the way it works. Now, you, but you don't really, the, the Clintons are not a dynasty. That's very important. The Clintons had to be written about. you got to sell a book. There's no question <laughs> about that. Uh, but what do you do? A husband and wife are not a dynasty. Uh, the book chapter starts with the fact that the dynasty will become in 2040 when um, Charlotte <laughs> is first eligible to run for the House of Representatives. <laughs> Should she be elected, and of course she will have had maternal and paternal grandparents uh, who are all politicians, she will really be the first dynast in the, in the family. 
And so what do you do about, about the Clintons? Well, what I chose to do, and, uh, and I'm, uh, I like to think I'm right, is I call them a partnership. And I could play on that thread, which you could see from almost the beginning of their relationship. And that in itself is unusual uh, in politics. So you have to ask how I dealt uh, with, with the Clintons at least. The Bushes, well, again, you, you deal with a family that you think everybody knows something about. What do you do? But they definitely that? qualify. As a well, there are, yes, yes. What happens is the Bushes, who are a dynasty, but deny that they're a dynasty, <laughs> and the Clintons, who are not a dynasty, but want to be a dynasty, <laughs> it gets very confusing at this point, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, you know, talking about the in-laws, Steve, you know, that's one of my favorite things of because when you write women's history, as I do, you come upon letters that have never been published. And the Adams, as you say, have saved all of their letters. And, um, and actually, there, there are two that I just love. One is from Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife. And she was here in town. Um, he was Secretary of State. And she was running him for president. And she says that in her. She's writing these gossipy, wonderful letters home to John Adams after Abigail dies. And she says, she says, it's my vocation to get him elected president. But um, the year of the Missouri Compromise, which was 1820, uh, Congress stayed in session much longer than usual in order to hammer out the compromise. And so then it was over. They finally adjourned. She goes to a meeting of the trustees of the orphan asylum, uh, which Dolly Madison had helped found after the British invasion. And she writes this letter home to John Adams, which had never been published when I found it, and it was just so wonderfully eye-opening. Uh, she says that she's gone to the meeting of the trustees, and they said, we're going to need a new building. And she said, why? And they said, well, the session had been very long, and I'm quoting here, and our great and moral fathers had left 40 cases to be provided for by our institution. Oh. Yes, the Congress had left 40 pregnant women behind. And there were, there were only like 187 members of Congress at the time. Now, some of them might have been recidivists. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but um, uh, she then says to Adam, she says, so I recommended to that great and moral body that they take the $2 additional that they have voted themselves as an increase in pay and use it for uh, to build a foundling institution. So, you know, it doesn't get much better than no. that. <laughs> and do you remember what she called her autobiography? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Autobiography of nobody. And she wrote that when she was the first lady of the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was fairly depressed. Okay. <laughs> who, were they, were, who would be your favorite? Of the what? Oh, of the dynasties. <laughs> uh, not yours. No, 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 no. We'll put well, aside. Put aside. Well, in, in going through your book, um, you know, I loved the Livingstons because the, the living, again, the Livingston women were so interesting. Um, the, the New Jersey Livingston women. But uh, now I didn't like Janet Livingston one bit. Um, she, she was the wife of Richard Montgomery, after whom Montgomery County is mysteriously named. Uh, but um, she, he was one of the first people killed in the war, and the Revolutionary War. And you would have thought she was the only widow in America, you know, from her letters. But, um, but Sarah, Sally, Sarah Livingston Jay, the wife of John Jay, was one of the most delightful people and wonderful letter writers ever. Well, here's we go, male and female. I hated the Livingstons. <laughs> the Livingstons started the first law, lord of the manor, uh, went to upstate New York. He had a piece of land, about 2,000 acres, on the Hudson. And then he got 200 acres uh, on the Massachusetts border. And he asked for a patent from the Royal of Canada for his land, which was contiguous. So they gave him uh, something. Uh, they gave him a patent to something like 250,000 acres that he didn't own. It was perhaps the greatest land gross land, land <laughs> and so forth. That, that's how that particular industry family started. Uh, and what happened to them? Just to finish it, because they did have some fascinating women. I stick with you on that. Uh, but if the if the if the Adamses left politics 
because they were so flinty, so unsocial, that in a sense the American people couldn't accept them as politicians. The Livingstons were exactly the reverse. They left politics because they didn't want to deal with the hoi polloi. They, these are people that they didn't want to associate with. So the Livingston, as a family, moved back to their estates, uh, married each other, had fewer children, uh, made their money by acquiring, not by agriculture, uh, and um, became a sort of a Shinto group. No, 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 we have okay. well, right, Edward Livingston, who was mayor of New York, oh, yes, we have. came to New Orleans, uh, and married, he didn't marry one of those Dutch people, he married Louise Davisak, yes. and she was uh, from Santo Domingo, right. and she was quite a person. And in fact, she did eventually retire after, after he was minister to France, and when he was appointed to that, crazy John Randolph uh, was in the, in the Senate, and he said, oh, I can't think of anybody better to go as our minister to France than Louise Davisac with um, and him. And, um, <laughs> and he said, and then she won't have to put up with all these yahoos in Congress. He actually used the word yahoos. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, she, was, she did eventually retire to New York, but she became one of the first real conservationists in this country. And I, I can make an argument that he started the conservation movement. So, and, and he wrote in his old age that he owed everything to her. No, she was great. She was yeah. great. But, but uh, uh, just uh, my favorite, since I told you my unfavorite, uh, <laughs> would, would have been, uh, this happened a few years ago on, a, on one of those talk radio shows where uh, for President's Day uh, they had asked me for my favorite president, hoping that they would then build a Q&A or a, a call-in show. Uh, and I said, oh, my favorite president is William Howard Taft. The, the moderator was very upset because he thought I'd do uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, or Lincoln, or, or somebody, somebody you've heard of. Somebody who you could build a program <laughs> around. And I said, but you didn't ask me who's the best president. You said, who's my favorite president? William Howard Taft was the nicest man who was ever president. <laughs> he loved his parents. They loved him. He loved his wife. She loved him. He loved his, uh, you know. He wasn't a particularly good president, but oh, wow, that love, that's got to mean something. We're being flashed a sign called Q&A. Okay. Let me just say, though, before we do that, the, you know, you, you talked about the Flinty Adams. Oh, right. And, you know, husbands and wives loving each other and all that. A, a letter that I came upon from writing this last book, Catherine James, was one from Abigail Brooks Adams, the wife of Charles Francis Adams. Again, had never been published. They were briefly in Washington when he was in Congress uh, before he went off. He was the last. I mean, it was just the three of them. Uh, the John, John Quincy, Charles Francis Adams. And he went off to become the Union's ambassador to the court of St. James. But he was briefly here in Congress for the, for the secessionist Congress, the 36th Congress. And she's writing all these hysterical <laughs> letters home to Henry Adams, their son, and including things like President Buchanan is a heavy old toad, and um, other such things. But my favorite was, and this plays entirely into your theory about their, their flintiness and inability to get reelected. She says, I would advise any young woman who wishes to have an easy, quiet life not to marry an Adams. <laughs> she says, they are headstrong, willful, and fighting ever, but honest, brave, and straightforward. Okay, I, I, I've, I've got to enter that because <laughs> this is very interesting. The Adamses were poor folks. They were farmers. Uh, they, uh, it wasn't until that generation and that lady, that woman, right. that woman whose father, uh, whose father, father was the richest man in Boston. Right. And suddenly the Adamses had money. Uh, and when you talk, uh, we discussed earlier why they may have left politics, their flintiness, but having money helped them leave politics. Money we think of in politics as something that's going to continue the dynasty. In this case, the Henry Adamses and the Brooks Adams found a lot of other pursuits that they would have preferred to do, and they, and they had uh, the, the, the money to do it. In fact, as you go through these dynasties, they're, one of the great sources of money is how well these people married. It wasn't just the <laughs> always wise. Oh, right. You know, the freeing houses were, became, as, as ministers, clergymen, 
uh, and ultimately, in the last three generations, uh, had married uh, a Ballantine of Ballantine Ale, a Havemeyer of the Havemeyer Trust, uh, a Proctor of Proctor and Gamble. They did very well. In fact, Rod, Rodney's father, Peter, uh, who was a sort of a... Rodney Friedman has his down Congress from New Congress with uh, Rodney uh, Friedman has his father had the same seat uh, in Congress, was sort of a friend because he, there weren't many moderate Republicans around to, to, to join together. And when I wrote that, he never spoke to me again. That was in <laughs> for them. You do not talk about where the money comes right. from. Right. So All okay. right, questions? Anybody? Yes, go ahead. Harrison. Well, the Harrisons were pretty much related to everybody. Um, uh, they were certainly they were certainly related to the Clavens. They were related to the Jeffersons, the Randolphs. Um, you know, they were they were very much there. But only two of them, right? Did you find more than two Harrisons? Well, I found enough to write a chapter. The, the, the Harrisons just kept moving moving west, and so uh, from from a distinguished Virginia family, they kept going to. Indiana, and then that, the last one ended up in, in Wyoming. Uh, and um, uh, they, um, hmm, how do you describe a family that probably shouldn't have even been president of the United States? Uh, uh, <laughs> William Henry Harrison was clerk of the court in Hamilton County at the time that he was nominated to be president. Uh, they were, they were I, I'd say they were probably the most undistinguished family in my book, although Ben, the one who became president, and I think, think a not very assertive president, was actually a great general in the Civil War. Everything that, that on the march to the sea, he was, he was right there. So you, I, I can't take that away from him. Well, of course, uh, that's why William Henry got elected, too, was Tippecanoe. Well, it wasn't much of a battle. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that, yeah, you have to have a favorite. You have to have one that's not a favorite. And I guess I put Harrison in that category. Who else? Um, you uh, decided to declare the Clintons a uh, partnership because, quite right, uh, they haven't got enough generations yet. Uh, but it strikes me that you're talking about a number of partnerships along the way, some of them at the beginning, like John and Abigail Adams, um, and you've mentioned some of the others, and of course we have Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, so mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting uh, part of the dynasties. <laughs> yeah, that, it, it, certainly it is. Uh, the... Um, Rewriting a book 50 years later caused <laughs> some problems with some. Obviously, it caused problems with the Kennedys because when I wrote, started in 1964, Jack had just been assassinated. And when I reread my chapter, it read like. Lives of the Saints? It, it, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it, it read like a myth. It's the way we see, thought of the Kennedys. And so it wasn't just adding 50 years, it was scrubbing down the Camelots to get there. You talked about the, the, the Roosevelt's, Franklin, and, and uh, Eleanor, who I admired greatly, uh, and at the time interviewed some of their children. They were tried to be generous to them. Uh, but, what ha but ultimately, 50 years later, looking back, uh, particularly the three eldest sons, with the children, five of them had been married 19 times and divorced 14 times. Uh, uh, Elliot uh, had been investigated eight times by congressional investigative committees. Uh, uh, Franklin was the representative of Trujillo in Washington. Uh, and you had to ask a lot of questions about how they were raised, who raised them, if anyone raised them, <laughs> the grandmother raised them, and so forth. But they turned out to, to be the most exploitive children of, of, of presidents. And I, and I had to rewrite the book to say that. I couldn't leave them up on a pedestal as I had 50 years ago. And I, and I, I worry indeed about Franklin and 
Eleanor, great people, but what about the parents? Hmm? Do you think that the vaccine, the, is that, is that, I mean, yes, the time has passed and we've learned more about these people, their lives have evolved, but is it also true that there's some degree of history writing being more skeptical than it was 50 years ago? Oh, I'm sure that's true. Uh, um, in, in this case, uh, there was still a story to be written, to put it that way. I mean, they, 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 their lives continued. Uh, they kept getting into increasingly messy divorces uh, and other things, and some financial scandals as well. Uh, what I interested me there, and I wish I had, had more time to pursue it, was, okay, what happened to their children and their grandchildren? Of course, the children were being not being raised by them, probably, but by their former wives. Uh, and the best I could figure out, they did very nice. They, they, they really did very nice. They, they, they didn't go into politics, by and large, with one exception. Uh, but they were professors, they were writers, they were educators. Uh, and in fact, with a, gra- with a great-grandchild, one became a rabbi. <laughs> it turned out in, in uh, has, a, has a synagogue in Ashland, Oregon. Well, uh, being from the West Coast, this all seems very East Coast establishment, <laughs> your so-called Ivy Leagues, all that stuff. As I, and as I start to see... Latinos taking over politics, um, West Coast people. I mean, look at the Supreme Court. I mean, I, I just I can't believe how undiverse it is in terms of background. But I'm wondering if this is the no end Protestants. Of it. There are no Protestants on the Supreme Court. No Protestants, <laughs> and and all the women are from Manhattan. Really. <laughs> um, so as we as we do become more diverse, and I wonder if this this is the end of the dynasty. Oh, no, really. I think it's the beginning. You're right. quite right in what you're saying, but first of all, with the empowerment of women over the last 50 years, we're going to have twice as many people who can be dynasts, so there's going to be a much greater there. And then, as we have groups, as you say, whether it's, a, whether it's Hispanic, whether it's Black, Cuban, and so forth, that they live in the same places by and large. And where they live in the same places, they have a voting block. And you're going to see them building up, as we have starting in Congress, whether it's in, in South, uh, South uh, Beach, uh, Miami, whether it's in uh, uh, South uh, Southern California, California, and so forth. So we're going to get a much more diverse. We're, we're always going to have dynasties. It's, it's in the cards. We are a free country. We elect people. <laughs> but what we don't have, we don't always have the same dynasties. Dynasties die and dynasties are born. So I think your point is well taken, but you have to look ahead. The dynasties of the future are going to look more like the ones you're talking about. I mean, there have already been the Roy Balls, uh, you know, Hispanic father and daughter, the Sanchez's, the sisters, right? And you've got, you've got uh, in Florida the Diaz Ballards. I mean, you've, you've got, you know, several families already that are, um, that are sending people, several people of the same generation or of two generations to yeah. Congress, and it's, it's only going to increase. Yeah. The Castro dynasty, Castro that's dynasty. right. Right, right, right. That's right. That's a question. Sure, back there. It's you. <laughs> I have a comment that uh, Rose, Franklin Roosevelt's grandfather, Warren Delano, Delano, Delano. Made, his, made his money the opium trade. <laughs> Was it the drug trade? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The, the opium he trade. had ships. That's what ships did. They went back and forth. Yeah. At the, at the India end, the opium was procured by a family of called called the Tatas, and now they are the largest industrial family in India. Just a thought. Anything more? I don't know. You know more than I do, so I'll leave it. <laughs> yes, sir. Sir. Hmm. Sorry, you haven't mentioned the Rockefellers, uh, whose political uh, tendencies rate covered quite a range. Uh, I wonder if you might uh, mention something. Really also, two, also several states. Yeah, there are really two things to be said about the Rockefellers. 
first of all, would be that the generation of the robber barons, the Rockefellers, the Harrimans, the Morgans, the Goulds, didn't go into politics. I didn't go, uh, run for office. You know, Goulds was... Would buy they ran other people for they office. Yeah, he was a politician. <laughs> he didn't do that. But again, as we said before, they would be happy to, to rent their children, <laughs> to marry their children. So, in fact, John D. Rockefeller Sr., the richest man in the United States, his daughter married the son, uh, uh, his son, wait, I'm going to get it straight. Uh, his son married the daughter of Nelson, of uh, Aldridge. Nelson Aldridge, or Aldridge, who was the most powerful politician in the United States. They joined together, and then their son became Nelson Aldridge Rockefeller. What you start to see there, and I, I include this in another category, are sort of the mix and match dynasties. It was really the collection of Rockefellers and Aldridges that created that as a dynasty. Like Miss Roberts, I'm originally from New Orleans, and uh, while we appreciate the I Claymore, see your fleur de lis. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, while we appreciate the Claymores a lot, uh, one dynasty that perhaps gets more attention in Louisiana is obviously the uh, the Longs, and I would want to ask if, if you found anything interesting about them in particular. Do you have a chapter on the Longs? I do. The Longs, yeah. The Longs were busy fighting other Longs. <laughs> uh, they, they were quite, quite fascinating uh, at it. I, it have to, it, I'm not sure there's still a Long around running for office. The last Longs were busy running against each other. That was Speedy Long. Speedy, Speedy and Gillis. Yeah, yeah Speedy and Gillis. In the state legislature. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, of course, you know, Huey Long was the, was the great character and, and um, really, you know, enormously powerful and corrupt in his time. Um, and, but then he had two brothers, Earl, who, of course, became governor and also very powerful. Uh, and then his brother, George, who was in the House of Representatives. And George would get up every year and give a speech about the Redcoats coming. And, um, and so he was very much against the Marshall Plan or anything like that because it involved giving aid to Great Britain, and he was against it. Um, and, we, and, you, and of course, there was Blanche. Blanche was the the wife of uh, of, of, of Hugh. Earl, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 While well, Earl had played his star, and others, yes. and it was an interesting family. <laughs> Other questions. So in general, do you think that political dynasties are beneficial to our political system in general? Are they a sign of health or sort of decay for our political system? I'll give two answers to that. One is a semi-objective reason because I've been studying them for 50 years. I've seen a lot of them. And I would say on balance, they have given us above average service. So we haven't lost out in looking back historically. There have been some weak ones, some very great ones, like the Roosevelt's. But I think in general, we, 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 we've done well by them. The other question, since, it's, since my argument is that we will always have them, there is apple like apple pie, uh, is that while the word dynasty seems to be regressive and tight, that it, it is part of the flow of history. Uh, it is part of, of our moving on uh, and I think that's that's perfectly positive in general. Uh, and in fact, I'm really more interested in some ways uh, in why they die so that others can replace them, uh, rather than why they why they were there. They're they're ambitious. They're bright. Uh, they're smart. They want their good jobs, and they go after them. But we touched on some of the reasons why they die. But there are lots of reasons. The the great fascinating Breckenridge family of, of Kentucky, marvelous, fascinating family, a, a family of passion in which they were equally divided between the, the civil, between the South and, and the North for each other and all of that. And then, of course, after the war, Kentucky wasn't yeah. much of a place to live. Well, and so they, yeah, so they, they started, started to move other places. in the United States, and then he signed up with the Confederacy. Yeah. So there was a problem there. Yeah, and they, yeah. so, and they, and they, um, uh, 
And they did some wonderful things, but it was they were no longer a dynasty. They no longer had a base in Kentucky. So they were the Lees of Virginia were fascinating family in, in the same way. Uh, and you look at them, uh, and after a while they left politics, and what did they do? They all went into the military. They were either generals or admirals or married to generals. And so instead of being a political dynasty, they became a military dynasty, which was another type of public service. So it's really very, you know, I find them very interesting, and they're not at all worried uh, that we're going to turn our lives over to people who are strictly a hard day. I think that I think that words public service are the right words. I mean, first of all, keep in mind in all in every field you see people going into the field that their parents are in because that's when they know, and uh, it's familiar, and so they do it. Uh, but but I do also think that there is um, in families where public service is highly valued that the the generation coming up and Coach Al can speak to this. Uh, you know, that the that there is a sense that that is an obligation almost. But the other thing to keep in mind is that these families are like all American families. It's not like they're all marrying each other. They're marrying everybody. And so you're talking about, you know, a, a ethnically diverse and religiously diverse and in some cases racially diverse uh, groups of people because because that's who, that's who we all marry. They do marry. Uh, they, often enough, they marry each right. other. Is that sort of, you, know, you look at Howard Baker. Howard well, Baker, who we love dearly, his his father was in Congress and he died. His, 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 mother. his mother was there too, and he he then married Everett Taft Jackson's daughter. When she died, he married Nancy Landon Casabon. Her father was ran it for president against FDR. That's quite a collection. <laughs> but but it's, you can't it, point to but that's, that's that's who they do. That's who they, that's, that's with their neighbors and friends. Those it's not endless comments. <laughs> The question is, is it a danger so many of these dynasties seem to have come from money? I, I don't think that's true, is it? They, they ended up with money. They didn't necessarily <laughs> start with money. So. Is it that way? Okay, we are getting the least subtle signal you've ever seen to stop. <laughs> um, so we will do that, but uh, Steve and I will both be signing books, and I think there's a little reception out here. And uh, thank you all so very, very much for coming. Congratulations.